Last saw Penelope, she was in old London town delivering a painting to the Earl of Crumpet. But that foul, foggy fiend, the Hooded Claw, had other plans. Yes. After they did uh, Wacky Races, they spun off Penelope Pit Stop into her show. They spun off Dastardly and Muttley into Dastardly and Muttley and their flying machines. They liked the way it worked in Wacky Races and said, well, let's use him here, too. Art Scott, who was one of the directors at Hanna-Barbera, a very nice man, called me into his office and said, listen, I, I thought you should know that they're going to do a spin-off on Penelope Pit Stop. And I said, what's a spin-off? I had no idea what he was talking about. And then when he told me, of course, I was thrilled. In keeping with the old-fashioned theme of, of like wacky races, they, they made her show more like the perils of Pauline. So you took this adventurous girl, put her on these different adventures with a classic melodrama villain out to stop her, and then you bring in the anthill mob as her protectors. It was, it, it was really cool. It's even more like a, a, a silent film in terms of, you know, I mean, no silence, but in terms of the structure with the bad guy and the two identities. Each half hour had a specific theme. Uh, Penelope and the Antil Mob might have been in a different area of the world. So one week they might be in the Arabian Desert, the next week they might be in downtown Manhattan. And each week you had the Hooded Claw trying to find ways of getting Penelope's inheritance. Penelope Pitstop inherited a great deal of money. And he was her guardian, but he was, he was called Sylvester Sneakley. And as her guardian, he was a very modest, well-spoken man. But then he turned into the Hooded Claw. As the Hooded Claw, I'll make sure that this is Penelope's last roundup. <laughs> Penelope evolved a little bit more from a design sense. She wasn't in her racing gear. She had riding pants on. And she did have a racing helmet on, I guess, just to keep the similarities between the two characters together. But it was a very much differently designed helmet. When Penelope got her own show, I was asking Evo why they redesigned the character. And he said, well, because they were on screen a lot more. They evolved. You know, you look at any of the Hanna-Barbera characters, you, you see an evolution. And that was theirs. You know, they got their own show, so they got a little bit more of a star treatment, I guess. Did you hear that, Mr. Claw? Penelope wins. Only till next time. Believe me, only till next time. <laughs> Pauline was hysterical. I mean, Pauline could take, you know, three words that no one could make funny, and, and his inflections and the way he said it, it was hysterical. Blast! If it weren't for a shortage of evil henchmen, I'd fire you. I'll have to go to the carnival myself and do a little dirty work. And the smart thing about casting Paul is, because again, you've got a villain <laughs> in this piece trying to do somebody harm, but you put a voice actor like Paul Lynn behind that character, and it takes any kind of threat totally away. Paul Lynn was what really made that like a party, because he was so funny. We were all laughing so hard at him that we could barely get up to the microphone to do our lines, because he was such a funny, funny, witty man. Isn't there one ounce of good in you? Yes, I promise not to laugh and that marvelous laugh that he had. <laughs> nothing can save her now. Is the hooded claw right? Can nothing save our Penelope? I've got my fingers crossed. The Ant Hill mob in the Wacky Races um, had seven little men. You pair that up with the helpless damsel Penelope Pitstop, and in a way you have Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Like in the Wacky Races, how you have, you know, 11 specific cars and personalities around them. Well, it's the same thing with the Ant Hill Mob. The next year, they had seven different men and different personalities. They didn't use a traditional hero. They kept it really accessible for kids, I think, because you had Penelope as the fun, cute girl in trouble. The Ant Hill Mob are her protectors, yet you don't bring in the element of romance and make it icky for the kids. Come on, Chuckaboo, come on! Mel Blank did Chuckaboo. It's weird because they like they changed that 
car drastically to fit into Penelope Pit Stop. Because again, it had a personality and it, you know, re-reacted and everything else. And if it didn't want to do something, maybe you end up chasing the car, you know, trying to, to retrieve it, to do whatever they had to, to save her. They always were trying to rescue her, and she would always find a way for herself to get out. But, but then she would give them the credit. Ah, little old me is safe again! Blast! Cheat! Foul! Blast! Squadron, man your planes! Stop that pigeon! Stop that pigeon! Dastardly and Muttley, that was the one with all the wacky planes. I had a ball on that, designing uh, ridiculous airplanes. Jerry designed the majority of the airplanes in that show because that was a given. I mean, you know, you took one look at what he did on Wacky Races and you said, look, you just take these things and have a ball. Oh, I was thinking of the World War I era planes because they were pretty funky looking and just, I'd take off from that and just do ridiculous planes, like I say, as, as many as 10 wings. Some would have two, some would have four. I'd have all these attachments that they would use to try to catch the pigeon. But it was basically World War I airplanes that, that was my kickoff point. I know originally, when they did Dasherly and Muttley and her flying machines, it wasn't Dasherly and Muttley. It was the Baron, and he had this dog that was not like Muttley, but it was kind of the same type of dog, except he was a little more stupid. But this Baron, he was like this German guy, and it was called Stop the Pigeon. And I guess because Dasherly and Muttley were so popular on Wacky Races that they spun them off into their own shows. The Dasherly and Muttley characters were fleshed out a lot better in the Flying Machines series than they had been the Wacky Races. They're definitely the same characters, but you know, with the Wacky Races, when you've got 11 different cars and probably 20 something different drivers, you know, there's only so much you can do, only so much you can write, only so much time you have to develop a character, and you really didn't need anything more than you had. I think they certainly developed the relationship between Dastardly and Muttley more in the Flying Machines, but of course they got more screen time. Even though Dastardly and Muttley got the most screen time in Wacky Races, they got even more screen time when it was their own show. One of the ways they fleshed out Muttley's personality is um, they had him metal hungry. I suppose you want a medal for saving me. <laughs> oh, all right. Here's your medal. And also, Muttley was able to fly now in this show. All he had to do was just twitch his tail, and then he, he, he could fly. The two new characters that they created for Dastardly and Muttley were Zilly and Clunk. Zilly was a nervous ninny who was always afraid of his own shadow. He'd actually shoot down in his raincoat. He'd be like, Muttley, fetch him, and Muttley would begrudgingly go fetch him. Clunk was one of these Don Messick voice tricks where he used to do kind of vocal sound effects. We whoop, whoop, oh, we whoop. Plunk says we're ready to take off with another cartoon. Oh dear. The latest invention that Clunk came up with to try and get the message from that pigeon, you know, when it, it invariably it always failed. So as Dastly's falling again down to earth, the telephone rings. You had the general phoning in all the time, always yelling at Dasherly for something. You never understood him, but you didn't care. Hello? Oh, uh, yes, our general. Yes, we're going to get the pigeon this time. Why were they trying to stop the pigeon? Nobody knows. He's flying a mission. They never said what the mission was, but they had to stop him. From what, I don't know. But it, it was kind of had that or World War I mentality to it, I guess. Stop the pigeon, 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 stop the pigeon. Stop the pigeon. I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't much of a song, but it definitely caught you. And even just mentioning it, it makes me think, well, now I'm going to drive home and hear that theme song in my head for the next two days. Now him, jab him, time him, grab him, stop. Magnificent Muttley was a great little short. It sort of broke up the two uh, Dastardly and Muttley cartoons by having these dream sequences. Muttley's sleeping and you know, Dastardly like screaming at him about, you know, wake up Muttley, you're dreaming again. Wake up there, Muttley, you're dreaming again. You're not Robin Hood and you're not Gunga Den. Muttley would be having these big daydreams of what he, what he thought he was or what he could do. Dastardly put him to work mopping the floor and he'd pretend he was a musketeer with it or something. And at the end, he'd be like jabbing Dastardly with the, with the mop. Muttley! Stop daydreaming and get going! Right!
when they came back to do Dastardly and Muttley, it'd say, okay, now you're wearing the flight goggles and you're, um, and you're, you know, chasing a pigeon around. I think Muttley's reaction was like, you know, huh, okay. And, you know, it didn't matter to him. He was still working. Not a fashion, 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 fashion. What did you say? That's better. I love Hanna-Barbera cartoons. They were brilliant, but they didn't make a big deal of it. You know, they were so funny and so wonderful. I just appreciated them so much. It was just something about them, just something about the way they were put together. Again, the, the quality uh, of those cartoons were just leaps and bounds above anything that was being done at the time.